much for being here on this uh, morning panel. I um, appreciate all of you making it out of bed early. I know that by the third day, the days and the nights get longer and longer, so it's a real pleasure to see so many of you here. My name is Matina steves Gridnev. I'm the Brussels Bureau Chief for the New York Times, and it's a real privilege to be uh, moderating this uh, very high-level panel on a very pressing issue for the European Union and its neighbors and, in fact, the world. Um, we are in a, as you've been hearing for the last few days, I'm sure there is growing cognizance of the difficulty and the historic significance of the moment we're in. And few people feel and know this better than uh, the people uh, on this panel and the populations that they represent as, as elected officials. Um, it's, uh, so it's really fantastic to be able to have this conversation this morning with them. I'm just going to briefly introduce everyone and uh, jump straight into our discussion and debate. Um, I will make sure to leave time for questions at the end. So please uh, don't hesitate. It'll be wonderful to hear and engage from you, especially as we're blessed to finally be able to be in the same room together. So uh, to my left, I have the president of Estonia, Alar Karas. Next to him is the prime minister of Georgia, Irakli Garibashvili. Further down, uh, the prime minister of Moldova, Natalia Gavrijita, and Last but not least, the Foreign Minister of Austria, Alexander Schallenberg. Um, we have been in a very intense debate and discussion that at times becomes emotional um, about the future of the connection between the European Union, a bloc of 27 countries, and its eastern neighbors. Uh, the ties, cultural, historical, and obviously political, are deep and the Russian invasion of Ukraine has brought those ties to the fore and has accelerated and catalyzed not only the aspirations of many of the people um, in the European Union's eastern flank, but also the existential need of those countries to align themselves ever closer to the European Union and to find a clear path to accession to the EU as fully-fledged members. It's in that spirit, of course, that Ukraine has pursued EU membership, and it's in that spirit that its neighbors have also done the same. Um, and it will be that path and um, the opportunities, but also the challenges and the way those prospects are perceived with the existing members of the European Union that will be really the core of our discussion today. Um, I suppose one way to start this conversation with all of you is, is the European Union sort of candidate status and a path, a clear path to full accession, the imperative right now, or are alternative, potentially new types of association with the EU also desirable at this point? And, and I want to, to start with you, Prime Minister of Moldova, do you think that alternatives, as have been floated, for example, in recent days by President Emmanuel Macron of France, could be appealing, um, or is being a full member of the European Union a one-way street for, for your country? So the European Union is actually a community of values, um, and uh, this is why we think Moldova should be firmly anchored in this community of values because we believe in democratic institutions, in the rule of law, in uh, respect of human rights. So it's a block that brings peace, collaboration, and value-based prosperity. Now, especially in these very difficult times, people need to be uh, anchored in the, such a future for Moldova. So the Moldovan citizens in the last parliamentary elections voted uh, overwhelmingly uh, for uh, a president, a parliament, a government 
that all look in the same direction, that one on a platform of improving uh, or reforming the justice sector, uh, improving the rule of law, uh, eradicating corruption, improving the way that the institutions work. Uh, and despite all the crisis, we have been working towards this uh, goal. So uh, Moldova has already, uh, for example, made uh, a number of reforms in the justice sector. Uh, you know, uh, just recently, uh, a, f a former uh, f US federal prosecutor who, who is of uh, Moldovan origin has won the competition to be nominated as the anti-corruption prosecutor. Uh, there, is, uh, the there are already uh, plans and legislation to uh, do external evaluation of judges and prosecutors. And all of these reforms um, were already underway, are very much supported by the people, and show that Moldova at, it, at, at its heart um, deserves to be part of the uh, European Union. Now, of course, that this has been a path, and we've had the association agreement, the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. Um, we have different fora for cooperating with uh, the European Union. Now, uh, we welcome the uh, possibility to participate in the European Peace Facility, and we will be receiving assistance, uh, including for non-lethal equipment for our military, for improving our protocols, our communication, our medical services, and so on. Um, you know, we are uh, discussing with the European Union on uh, liberalization of transportation agreements, on removing of quotas uh, for our export of our goods. Uh, so. We welcome any mechanism for bringing us closer together, improving our cooperation, as long as this does not um, replace the path uh, to membership. And um, <clears throat> you know, this, uh, the initiative that uh, President Macron launched, the, the European uh, Political Cooperation Framework, uh, we think is a possibility to bring closer together uh, faster uh, at a political level the dialogue uh, between uh, the European Union and uh, countries that are candidate countries or aspire to be candidate countries. Uh, but we think, and, and we have received public assurances already that this is not a replacement mm -hmm. for uh, the membership uh, pathway. So uh, we strongly believe that uh, membership in the European Union is uh, actually what uh, distributes this peace, stability, and value-based prosperity. And uh, you know, we want to be part of the free world and of this uh, EU families. Prime Minister Garibashvili, um, <clears throat> you have also um, uh, sort of aspired to, you're also aspired to EU candidate status and, and membership. Do you share this assessment that uh, other types of association could be attractive for Georgia, um, provided they don't preclude or replace um, full membership uh, prospects? Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting us. This is a great opportunity to talk about the Georgia's aspiration to become a member of the European Union. It's actually a great opportunity because of COVID, we didn't have a chance to meet in person. So this is a great opportunity once again. Thank you for this. Well, second, I want to say that, of course, Georgia has been a very reliable and uh, a loyal partner to the European Union. Uh, this is a choice of our people. It does not belong only to the Georgian government, but this is a choice. I would say this is a civilizational choice of the Georgian people. And we've been uh, very loyal. We've been a uh, dedicated partner to the European Union because we share the same values, uh, same principles. Um, in 2014, you know that we signed the association agreement. This is the main document. This is a roadmap for our uh, ultimate goal, which is the uh, full-fledged EU membership. Uh, since then, of course, we, we have a free trade agreement. We have some tangible results, such as the visa-free regime, which is also very important to the Georgian citizens. And of course, just recently, we uh, submitted the application for the EU membership. Uh, to respond to your question, I would say whatever brings us closer to the European Union, to the EU membership, is of course acceptable for us. Because uh, 
we have no uh, other alternative. As I said, you know, this is the choice of Georgian people, and we will do whatever we can. We will do the maximum in order to get closer to the European Union, to get closer to the ultimate goal, which is the uh, full-fledged membership of the European Union. Interesting. And uh, President Karras, um, how do you how do you feel about these um, sort of about these aspirations becoming so much so much more urgent and so much more vital in the context of the war in Ukraine? And how do you think other colleagues of yours and your peers in the European Council um, help us understand the debate? within the Council and, and at, at, the, at the leadership level at the EU. Good morning, everybody, and it's also a pleasure to be here uh, this morning and uh, discuss this uh, very important uh, matter. To start with, I mean, Estonia has been always a very firm supporter of uh, enlargement policy. And uh, from our own experience, so we, uh, we started this process in uh, in 2005, sorry, 2005, yes, and it took us nine years to, uh, to reach the goal, and we uh, became amenders in 2014. So it's a, it's a long process, and uh, it is a difficult process. And uh, to answer the question actually asked from my colleagues is uh, whether we need some kind of uh, different type of uh, association before mm -hmm. we actually become a member of the European Union. Uh, I want to be very frank. We, we have been proposed the same type of uh, associations when we uh, started our process. And uh, we said no to this. Uh, you mean you were offered it? Yeah, we were offered oh, a I different see. kind of. And we are quite firm that we should uh, go with this candidacy and uh, to reach a goal as soon as possible. And we, we managed. So, uh, but it's always up to different countries. But if it doesn't substitute, as uh, uh, Prime Minister of uh, Moldova said, then we should discuss. But there is some kind of threat that uh, it might be substitute actually the real candidacy or the real membership of uh, EU. So one has to be extremely careful with these kind of proposals. And help me understand why you stand on the pro-enlargement side of this debate? Because we have been there, so we, we know how important it is to be a, a member of the European Union. We have been extremely lucky at the time because we had uh, very good neighbours, Scandinavian countries, who actually supported us and uh, to, uh, to reach a goal and to fulfil all these criteria. And um, this was extremely important. So that's why now the candidate countries also need friends to support uh, this process. And we proposed Ukraine together with uh, my colleagues from Latvia and Lithuania and Poland that Ukraine should become a candidate uh, to, the, to the European Union to give a green light because there is no fast track to, to say to start with because but it's a process and you have to have kind of uh, green light that you uh, to start with all these uh, process it to get as as it was said we share the same value it's a it, it, and at the end of the day it's a political decision that means the members of European Union feel that you are one of us criteria is one thing but also this kind of feeling that yes these countries are one of us interesting mr. Schallenberg um, you're gonna be inevitably the bad guy on this panel <laughs> I uh, won't. Um, I'm really curious to hear your reflection on this idea of values and political decisions versus the debate which is about no cutting corners, no fast track. And, and uh, we are very eager, I think, to be illuminated more in the thinking of that and why the countries that have applied in this unique context can't be fast tracked, at the very least, into candidacy. I mean, thank you, first of all, to invite me on this illustrious panel. Um, I know I won't be the bad cop here. Uh, I just came from, from a fishbowl meeting on the Western Balkans, and they're, they're very strongly interrelated. Uh, there's one thing is clear. The Russian attack on Ukraine has shattered the security architecture, has shattered many things we believed in uh, um, since the 24th of February, and this is now crunch time. And I believe the European Union has to get its act together. 
this is, we are, we are entering a more confrontational phase. And this will take years, if not decades. And it's, in politics, there's no vacuum. It's either we export security and stability in our model of life, or we are faced with somebody else's model of life. And um, the, the fact is we have to signal very clearly that these countries have an aspiration. They are clearly anchored in the European family. They're part of our family of values and, 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 and also economically. But there is no fast track. And if I just came out of this fishbowl meeting on the Western Balkans, North Macedonia has been uh, applying 17 years ago. 17 years ago. And we are discussing now whether we open the accession negotiations finally with them and Albania. So if you talk about Estonia, if you talk about Poland, at the time it was actually extremely quick, even Croatia. Now, um, if we had dealt with those countries the way we deal now with the Western Balkans and the way we are conducting the discussion, we're starting conducting discussions on Ukraine, on Moldova and Georgia, um, this is not very promising. And I believe what we have to do in this crunch time is to uh, get away from these templates we have. Mm -hmm. The templates of full accession with lengthy, cumbersome accession process which might take years if not decades. Then you have the association agreement and you have the economic area nobody's talking about, by the way. And uh, my, what our approach is in Austria is we have to make it tangible. We have to make a geopolitical... Enlargement is the biggest geopolitical instrument we have and the strongest we have. But giving candidate status and then nothing happens for the years afterwards is not working. And we're seeing it in the Western Balkans, growing frustration, people are looking elsewhere, and we are confronted there with, with you know, developments we don't like to see. And I don't, I, we shouldn't repeat the same mistakes uh, in, in Ukraine and, and Moldova and others. So our, my, my, what I believe what we should think about is a gradual integration. To have an etiquette as candidate country does not change anything for the people on the ground, does not solve any problem, doesn't bring you an inch closer to the common market. And I believe we have to think anew about the neighborhood policy. We have a responsibility as European Union. And yes, there is a confrontation going on, and we have to act accordingly. Right. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the component of reforms and, and the economic element. Let's not forget what the EU primarily was about, and it's you know, in, in process of becoming something different. But I want to pick on something you just said, that, you know, there, there's a, a fear here of um, false hope and, and sort of um, tokenistic gestures that don't mean anything. Um, and, and we've seen the frustration in the Western Balkans. And we've also seen how uh, citizens as well as governments are very affected and, and feel frustrated with political and social ramifications. Isn't there also a risk in this very, very unique, difficult moment for the EU to not do the symbolically important thing for these heads of government who are bringing their people with them and telling them we are members of the European family, this is our future, we are looking one way and that is that way. And in this very moment, the EU says, sorry, we'll find a different structure for you. Isn't there a risk that you're going to lose them because you didn't do the symbolic thing? I fully agree with you. We have to um, we observed. Moscow is looking at us, Beijing and others. And we have to act, and, and symbolism is, or political PR, if you might call it, is part of it. But it cannot be the solution. It's not the solution. We have to think harder on what we actually mean, just to grant a status of candidate country. And then nothing happens in 2023, 24, 25, 26. That's a very bad signal. And then we create frustration. It's a management of expectations. So yes, symbolism, absolutely. And I believe this European Council is an extremely important council. And what we Austrians are saying is we have responsibility not only towards our countries of the former Eastern Partnership, but also to the Western Balkans. So if you talk about Ukraine and Moldova, we have, and Georgia, we have to talk about Bosnia-Herzegovina, we have to talk about North Macedonia and Albania, and we have to talk about Kosovo. So this, this is our approach that we have as European Union um, a responsibility in our neighborhood. And again, as I said beforehand, either we start exporting stability and, and security and prosperity, or we will import insecurity and instability. What do you think about that? 
Well, I, I don't like to see this as a, as, a, as a symbolic step. So, and I, I guess this uh, war in Ukraine has also changed quite a lot of the mindset and uh, and the people's thinking uh, of his candidate countries how to proceed to uh, to deal off his, all these economic problems, security problems, and so forth. And uh, I am a strong believer that this war it's. It's a pity that we needed the war to, uh, to start discussing these quite uh, well, uh, tough topics. But uh, as I said, I believe it's not symbolic. That means these countries really now realize it is important to, uh, to step forward, first of all. And uh, secondly, for us, it's important as Euro members of European Union that we don't have these kind of gray zones in, uh, in Europe. And uh, we should avoid these kind of zones in, uh, in uh, in our close neighborhood. Interesting. Prime Minister, let's talk a little bit about the actual steps your country would need to take if it got candidate status, because that's actually when the difficult work begins, and right. it's not always going to make the leader very popular. The reforms can be very burdensome. So what would you see as top priorities for Georgia, and also what kind of support would you be expecting for your country in this context? Well, first of all, I think we should um, take into consideration the expectations of the people. I want to talk about Georgia, and I want to talk about Georgian people. More than 80% of our population support this idea that Georgia must become a member of the European family. And this is not a choice, again, I want to repeat, of our government. We have been striving, we've, we have been trying to become, to get closer to the European Union for centuries. We didn't start it in 2014 when we signed the association agreement. Instead, we, we, we've been trying to become a member of the civilized, you know, Europe and world for centuries, as I said. So now we need to manage the expectations of our people. Because from our perspective, how we see this process, because we believe that we've been, as I said, we are very loyal to the European values, principles, we're doing democratic reforms. We're doing all necessary things that is into the association agreement. We have fulfilled 45%, more than 45% of the association agreement has already been fulfilled. Uh, we have embarked on a very ambitious reforms agenda since 2014. We've been doing lots of improvements in every direction, whether this is rule of law, judicial reforms, open government, or in every direction we have huge progress. We have tangible progress, and people see it. So now the question is whether we raise this expectation, we tell our people that Georgia will get this, as it was said, symbolic, let's say political, let's say, a declaration, an acknowledgement that Georgia is part of this European family, or we should explain to them that it's not the right time, maybe we should do, you know, consider it later, or we need to see action now and today. Because as it was mentioned, this is a, it's a different world today. What has been, uh, what has happened in Ukraine, it's not a challenge uh, to only Ukrainian security. This is a challenge to the entire European security architecture. And I want to remind you about the war that we had in 2008. At that time, I have to mention, regrettably, that uh, we did not see such unity that is today. We welcome this unity. This is great. This is a very strong, let's say, reaction of the entire world, of the civilized world. But we, the Georgians, we paid a very high price since we regained our independence. We had two wars in, in the 90s when we regained our independence, one in Abkhazia, in Ossetia, and 2008, a large-scale war with Russia. And the result of this war is temporary occupation of our territories, of our historic territories. Now, we understand the concern that exists in the European Union, because as Minister mentioned, you know, they don't want to import all these you know, problems, let's say, into the European family. But we also understand that, you know, given granting the candidate status does not mean 
given the membership, right? It's still a long process, as it was mentioned by the president of Estonia. It's a long process. We understand that. And we have our homework, which is the association agreement. So that's my point. But we need clarity. And we need adequate and relevant reaction from the European Union. Prime Minister, clearly, from your intervention earlier, you mentioned several reforms that you yourself have also initiated in, in the same spirit as the Prime Minister of Georgia has been, just been talking about. Um, can, you, can you tell us a bit more about why the EU, sort of being closer to the EU in this moment, is so important to Moldova, in particular, I suppose, considering the Moldova's own security concerns with Transnistria, as well as the incredible um, assistance your country is offering to Ukrainian refugees and looking to the EU. Talk to us a little more about, about your country's very, very special role in, in this current moment and how EU membership can help. So let me start by saying that uh, I was in my first job and uh, younger uh, when uh, the Thessaloniki agenda <laughs> happened and Moldova was considered at that time uh, and we as, as a potential candidate country and we missed that window of opportunity. We didn't have a government that was willing to go in that direction. And my generation has lost its youth fighting you know, and for democratic institution and maintaining this hope for European integration alive. We have a historic window of opportunity now. As you said, this is a historical crunch time. We don't know when the next historical moment of opportunity will arise. Now, it just so happens that this comes at a very difficult time for our people. Uh, <coughs> Moldova is uh, very much affected economically by the war, the unjust war of Russia on Ukraine. Uh, we have inflation that has reached 27%. I know that inflation is a problem in uh, all European countries, but uh, we are poorer. We are affected uh, more significantly. Uh, we uh, are doing everything possible to receive uh, all the refugees, and after we have received uh, a number of refugees that amounts to 3.5% of our population, 85% of our people say we are willing to receive more because of these values that I talked about at the beginning of my intervention, because we believe that now there is this standoff between uh, the values of democracy, of rule of law, the European values, uh, and the values of autocracy, dictatorship. So we don't want you know, to miss this window of opportunity and several years from now look back and say, what happened to that extraordinary sentiment where you know, there was almost a constitutional majority uh, f you know, oriented towards pro-European reforms towards building institutions, building a truly European state. And you know, what happened to that government that, that was so determined? And we will have to wait for other generations to see when this may, ha may happen. So precisely because it's so difficult, it's, it's so difficult, uh, first of all, for Ukraine, of course, and our hearts, all our hearts go out uh, to those who suffer the terrible consequences of the war. Um, there are also economic consequences for the region and security consequences for the region. For the world, we have heard uh, plenty of it uh, at, at this forum. Uh, so precisely because it, it is so tough, the people need to know that if they get through this, if they stay on the path of reforms, no matter how difficult the context is, then they will be welcome in the family of European states. Again, we know that this will take time and we need to do our homework, but the uh, candidate status and the mechanism for integration actually has all the ingredients necessary to uh, 
you know, slow down the process if there's a reversal uh, and lack of progress uh, on certain reforms. So, um, you know, I would argue uh, uh, to uh, what the President of Estonia said that uh, uh, giving uh, at this moment, uh, at this historic moment of opportunity, candidate status only to Ukraine would uh, have the consequences of creating a gray zone uh, in Moldova. Now, of course, we have the Transnistrian region, uh, as you mentioned in your uh, question. Um, this is a frozen conflict. Uh, it's been frozen for 30 years. We have illegally stationed tr Russian troops on that territory. Um, but I want to say that we are in discussions. All the negotiating formats that are able to meet uh, a meeting. So we have the uh, format where both Russia and Ukraine are present, and of course that is not functional. Uh, but we have the in, uh, internal uh, processes. We discuss uh, the consequence. We, we uh, discuss to keep the situation stable, uh, to ensure that uh, the insecurity does not spill over to the territory of Moldova. We know that you know we would have to work on a solution uh, with the support of our partners uh, to the conflict in the process uh, of integration. But again, it's exactly as uh, Mr. Schallenberg said, you know, it's, uh, you know, will the European Union be an exporter of peace and stability? Will the European Union uh, help to resolve such situation? Will the European Union help to go on this pathway of reforms uh, and uh, make them irreversible? Mm. Will the European Union help these countries um, understand that uh, you know, if they do their homework, if uh, you know, there is this uh, um, progress, then meritocratically they, mm. they would be welcomed in the European family. Minister Schallenberg, I'm sure that listening to these prime ministers, you will agree with me that they sound more ardently, feverishly pro-EU than some heads of government in the EU. <laughs> How do you square that circle? The European <laughs> Union right now has in its membership at least one government that is increasingly untethering itself from the bloc, even and especially in this very, very difficult moment. How can you sort of look at these countries that are saying the right things and are trying to do the right things and are existentially trying to tie themselves ever closer to the bloc and look at your colleagues, your neighbors, and square that circle? Well, I believe that things are moving. Um, I claim that uh, holiday from history are over. We enjoyed a dividend of peace. Um, we enjoyed a high degree of naivety. And uh, we have to acknowledge, and I believe everybody does that, that Russia has the potential to be a spoiler elsewhere. And maybe the Russian eyes from Moscow are not only on Ukraine. You know your fair share, my friend, uh, about this. And we have Republika Srpska, we have other places, reaching from Libya, Syria, all along in the neighborhood of, of Europe. And we have, to, as, as European Union, and that's what I'm, I'm, I'm saying, uh, we have to rise to this task. And it's a political, it's not, it's not bureaucratic, it's not legalistic, it's not looking down the acquis communautaire line by line. When we, when the European, if you look at the history of European integration, Greece joined in 81, 1981. It was about, you know, uh, fostering and, and strengthening a young democracy. Spain and Portugal, 86, the same thing. Had we dealt with enlargement in the 2000s the same way we are doing it now, then probably Poland and, and Romania would not yet be members of the European Union. And we understood at the time it's about crossing the Iron Curtain, and we have to do the same now. And I believe that many capitals, or most capitals, if I look at the debates we are having, um, also with Paris, the French presidency now is, and I have high hopes in the French presidency and the run-up to this European Council, that we know that we have to get our act together. And Yes, we are always very good within the European Union to, um, um, you know, spill out publicly our differences, differences and discussions. But 
we have a very strong sense of unity and I'm sensing that in every meeting. And my hope is that this geopolitical moment we're living through in Europe won't be over by summer and then suddenly we lean back exhausted after four months and say, wow, we were good, but now back to the good old bad times. Uh, and, and maybe Ukraine, I mean, it's like a shock therapy we're living through. It needed, and luckily it seems it needed a war and a shock like this to make us believe that or understand that we, this is more than just you know number crunching and directives and regulations which have to be uh, implemented in the member states. It's about geopolitics. It's about model of life. It's about you know systemic rivalry and challenging. And I want. I always say I have, I have children. I have no grandchildren yet. But if I had grandchildren, I hope I have them that they can wake, grow up in a in a society which is free, open, pluralistic, according to Charles Popper. And that's what we are fighting for, and that's what we have to get uh, to understand in Brussels. That's certainly what the Ukrainians are fighting for on the behalf of the EU. They argue that they're fighting, they're putting their lives on the line on, on, on the behalf of, of the European Union and those values. Um, I want to switch gears a bit and, and approach this from another perspective. There's been some criticism uh, of the concept of tying the membership futures of your two countries to Ukraine's membership. Um, do you think that's fair criticism, uh, President Karras? I wanted to say it's kind of a misunderstanding that Estonia and our, our partners said that you know, Ukraine should, should become a candidate. So it's a, it's a, applies to Georgia and, and uh, Moldova as well, so it's not only Ukraine. But of course, uh, just to recall, when we started our process, we Estonians also felt, and we started first, and Latvia and Lithuania were behind, and we really believed that we have only one from a Baltic country who will become a member of the European Union. But it turned out that in the end we, we all joined the European Union together. So it then might happen here. So it's, the process started now because of war with Ukraine. But you are also have the applications you, you sent in, and the process is probably will start. And we, we shouldn't lose this momentum, not only because it's war in Ukraine, but uh, what was said, so many people in these countries, they are pro-European Union. It's 90-80%. It's not a government business. So it's, uh, it's uh, people from these countries want to join Ukraine, uh, want to join the uh, uh, European Union. Just recall, when we started, uh, this was less than 50%. That means our um, president at the time had to go from doorstep to doorstep to convince people that European Union is something you, you, we should really appreciate and, and join. So it's a, it's a different, different time and different story. So we shouldn't lose this momentum that these people want to join the European Union. Mm -hmm. I want to have a look in the room and see if there are questions here. Sure, please go ahead. Do we have a microphone, please? Thanks so much. If you can uh, just tell us your name and make sure there's a question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Daniel Ksutin from the Global Shapers Hub of Lviv in Ukraine. So if I'm talking about my generation in Ukraine, um, European integration has been a dream since uh, we remember ourselves, right? Since <laughs> we're very little. And I was wondering, uh, Mr. Schallenberg, maybe ha you have an, an advice for the Ukrainian youth. What can we do to advance uh, the European integration agenda in our countries? It's also relevant for the youth of Georgia, of Moldova. Um, I'm very impressed of what the youth has been doing already beforehand, uh, before the war. And when I, each time I visited uh, uh, Kiev, and, and I was there repeatedly, um, the NGOs, the civil society, grassroots movements, which are so important. And that's the best thing you can do. Um, your constituency is your country and you're the future and you have to make sure that the reforms, and you're not doing it because of the European Union. This is something we repeatedly say in the war Balkans as well. So you're doing it for your own sake. You want rule of law, you want separation of powers, you want checks and balances. So, and and, and you are, you, this is what you can do best to you know, be the, the, the loud voice to, to pressure the governments and the representatives to get the act together. And it's not about the European integration, it's because you want uh, Ukraine to move forward. Um, um, any, other, any other questions or thoughts from the room? Please, by all means. 
morning and thank you for a very interesting discussion. I'm from Armenia with the president's office and I guess we're also part of the, this neighborhood process with our own people circumstances. So the question is the following, because the process with acceleration, fast tracking, etc., will take time. And meantime, this neighborhood by itself is a status, which requires probably some relations or some, let's say, concessions on both sides. It could start with better trade relations, it could start with political, military, whatever different umbrellas, and step by step getting there. So what will be the perspective from Moldova or Georgia I mean, like the process now, before like entrance to European Union, how you feel your relations with European Union and what European Union could do to, to help you to get in the under current circumstances in a better shape? Sure. Um, I guess this is one for, for you too. Um, uh, you know, e even before this historic window of opportunity opened, uh, uh, Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia formed an associated trio because we moved uh, at a different pace. Uh, we, uh, both, both our people and our <coughs> governments had a different approach towards uh, the European Union and uh, bigger ambitions. ambitions. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is why we are actually now talking about these three countries, is because these countries uh, are at a different place. Uh, now, I believe that for other countries, uh, there is a moment of introspection as well. We see that the world order is changing, um, and so uh, I am sure this will lead to, uh, you know, d d internal discussions and uh, uh, conclusions uh, in uh, neighboring countries, and uh, there will be a process that results out of that. Right. Um, can I ask for some closing thoughts, President Harris? Well, I think it's um, actually for the record, I got uh, five grandchildren. So it's uh, very extremely important what's going to happen in, in the future in Europe. And uh, as I mentioned already, <laughs> We should avoid these gray zones and give hope to these countries. And it's up to these countries and people in these countries how fast this process is. And uh, I just uh, wish you all luck and uh, any assistance you need from from uh, European Union or members of the European Union, just, you just ask. Well, um, I think with, with that, I'll just, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for being in the room. I'd like to thank you for your honesty and uh, the passion with which you've spoken today on behalf of your people. Thanks so much for um, what I think was a nuanced debate and a really important moment for the future of the Eastern Partnership and of course for the future of the European Union. Please, please Prime Minister. In closure, I also want to uh, quote a famous Georgian scientist and uh, a co-author of the European Constitution, Mr. Mikhail Muscalishvili, uh, Michel Muscali. He said, Georgia knows that it belongs to Europe. Now Europe should make conclusions. That's my last comment. That's a, an apt conclusion. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>